Hey, what's up, guys? Thank you for joining me for a new video. And today I'm joined by Lion, somebody who I've had a uh, kind of a business relationship with for a few years. I run a website kind of in my spare time, and he has been purchasing ad space on that website for a few years. And I finally, it dawned on me, like I should invite him on the channel to share his success story as an entrepreneur. So Lion, man, thank you for being here today. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Ryan. I really appreciate it, man. It's good talking to you for finally after all this time, you know? Yeah, we've been back and forth on email for, <laughs> I think, years, right? Like plural. So Yeah, years, a definitely time. years. A long time. Yeah. So I know you in the context of a custom game that you launched on Amazon. And I would love to learn more about that experience. And I know a lot of people that view my channel are Amazon sellers. So why don't we start there and then kind of expand and talk more about the broad scope of ways you make money online? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So uh, the game you're talking about is called Chicken Shit, and it's a social drinking card game. It's essentially a game where you have to do challenges with strangers. So that's the main unique selling proposition of the game is in order to play, you have to play with other people. So it kind of has built in viral marketing into the game, which we've never really seen before. So we came up with the game because it's what me and my brother used to play when we would go out. We just came up with it and we play it with strangers. We play it with random people and they loved it. And then eventually our other business partner, Jimmy, he told us that we should make the game and he wanted to invest in it and he wanted to get us started. And he's even the one who came up with the name Chicken Shit. Before that, we called it like Assassins or something. It like makes that. a lot of sense though. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's perfect name. And once he said it, we were like, that's the one for sure. That's perfect. And so his contribution, even from the beginning, was huge. So uh, him and me and my brother and our other business partner at the time, uh, we started working on the game and we got it prototyped. Uh, we really wanted to get the rules down perfectly. We wanted the game mechanics to be perfect. And how it works is you just draw a card. There's like a challenge on the card. It'll tell you to like get a stranger to twerk or get a piggyback from ride from a stranger. And if you do it successfully, then you get to keep the card, you keep the points. And then if you fail, if you're drinking, you take a shot. If you're not drinking, you just don't get the points. And whoever has the most points at the end of the game wins. So it's perfect if you go out to bars, you go out to clubs, you go out anywhere in public to the beach. It's super easy for that. And, and most, most games are designed like Cards Against Humanity. You know, they're designed for mm -hmm. indoors, for to play inside your house, to play with friends. But there's not much stuff designed for playing when you go out, if that makes sense. So right. that's what we wanted to make it for. And uh, how it worked in the beginning is we got a prototype from a company in China. We designed everything ourselves, did all the graphic design. Uh, they sent us a prototype and then we got some manufactured, but the entire ride getting from there to on Amazon to here was a crazy ride. It was so difficult compared to our other company, Film Crux, which was just easy, snap. As soon as we launched, we were successful. Chicken Shit was the exact opposite of that. It, it was all kinds of pivots, all kinds of left and rights the whole way through to get to now. And now we're doing pretty good. And now we're about to start ramping up now that it's the end of COVID. But uh, just COVID alone, you can imagine having a social game during social distancing is the worst possible thing you could be doing, you know. But now that we're at the tail end, everything's working out a little bit better. Dude, yeah, that's um, that's a great example of like when things out of your control, you could say the universe are kind of just working against you. Yeah. Oh for my sure. God. Definitely. It felt like that for sure. But we were still positive about it. And like I said, we have other successful companies, so it wasn't too much of a big deal, but it definitely felt like the worst possible circumstances going wrong were going wrong. Uh, especially so in the beginning, what happened is everything went well with designing the game. We got the game made, we play tested it for hundreds of hours and it did way better than we thought. We thought, well, okay, maybe this would be good for some types of bars or something. But we played it in lounges, we played it in clubs, we played it on the beach, we played it everywhere, and people were obsessed with it. They were trying to buy it, and we didn't have any copies to give them because we didn't have the game made yet. We just had our prototype. We couldn't give it away. So we're like, this is going to be easy, right? This is like, there's a huge demand for it. So we went through this huge process. We initially tried to do a Kickstarter. The Kickstarter failed. And then we tried to do another Kickstarter. That Kickstarter failed. Essentially, we had too many uh too many chefs in the kitchen so we all had our own idea of what the best way to market it was and what ended up happening what i realized in retrospect is if we just did anyone's ideas 100 percent, they probably would have worked but mm -hmm. 
But the fact that we only like 25% did everyone's ideas, that mm -hmm. was kind of sabotaging everything and drilling holes in the boat. So we have to spend most of our time like getting buckets to get the water out of the boat. And we never really got any one of our plans done completely. My brother, his idea was really simple. He's like, order the cards, give them out to people. The game's viral in itself. Just get a bunch of decks, start handing them out to people. They'll play. Those people will want it. They'll play. Those people will want it. And it'll just go forever. Just make it viral in person. Mm -hmm. And then my ideas were more viral marketing because that's more what I do. That's how I blew up my other companies. Our other business partner, he had his own ideas. And our other business partner was cool. He was just kind of leaving it to us. He was just kind of like, you know, he's, he's like a, more of a silent partner type. But uh, once we got to a certain point, it was maybe, I don't know, maybe two years ago, sort of everything had failed. Nothing was working. We're like, you know what? I feel like uh, my brother and I, we grew up playing a lot of hard video games and we would always go to ourselves. We, don't, we try not to blame external circumstances. We're like, let me make sure I'm not the problem. So we kind of went back into the recesses and we're like, let me put my head down. Let me figure out what I'm doing see if I can get stuff to work and see if I actually know what I'm doing with business or if I'm just, you know, winging it, you know, if I don't know and I need to change something. And that's when I came up with the idea of Film Crux, which is my other company. And so Film Crux started as a blog and it's a filmmaking blog. And I started making it. I started doing a plan. And I was like, okay, I want to see if I can get rich in one year from Film Crux. Let me start in January 1st. It was like, I don't know if it's 2020, I want to say, maybe, uh, maybe 2019, January 1st, 2019. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can get rich by January 1st, 2020 with Film Crux. And so I made the website, made the blog, started posting things, started making videos and tutorials for filmmakers, started blowing up. We got like 20,000 email subscribers really quick. And like six months in, my brother's like, stop everything. We need to start making products for Film Crux, the ones you plan. Cause he was shocked that I got so many subscribers so fast. I was shocked too. And so I did, I made the first product. We made a product called singularity, which is sound design for filmmakers. And we made it inexpensive. It was like a $40 product. And we launched that and like we launched it. I think we did like a dollar. You could get the product for a dollar for the first hour, just to sort of test it out and was see it if physical our, or is a digital product. Digital. So it's just sounds and everything. It doesn't cost us anything to ship, you know, they just download it from the website. Mm -hmm. So we made this digital product. We released it just to our 20,000 email subscribers. And we're like, it's a dollar for the first hour, just to test if anyone wanted it. Cause we didn't want to sell stuff that people weren't into. And it went crazy. They're like $200 in like the first hour. So we got like 200 sales in like the first hour. And I was like, wow, you know, maybe it's just because it's a dollar. So we stopped it being a dollar. The first day we made like $400, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you have no money, like going from zero dollars and you're like grinding to making four hundred dollars in a day is like a huge jump you know and then that's how we knew we had something and mm -hmm. then by the end of the week uh we we linked up with other uh we linked up with uh no film school and they published the product over there we did like a giveaway and we gave away thousands of copies of singularity just to get our name out there we had no yeah. idea that many people were going to download it we thought we might get like 100 downloads thousands and thousands and thousands of downloads over like 24 48 was, hours was there something in like the zip file or whatever they downloaded that was like plugging you with your <laughs> something no. to get them back on your email list or something well the cool thing is that they have to go to the website and they would have to enter a discount code so um to get the download you go to the website to you and you check out so when you check out your email is automatically in checkout and you can opt out so we got tons of emails of all these people who ended up purchasing for free and they got something that's worth $40. That's really probably worth like $200 because we're just going lower prices mm -hmm. and they got it for free. So how could you not be kind of excited about that if it's something you need? And then we had all these emails in our list. And then so from there, we started paying Instagram posts, uh, paying for Instagram posts from pages, other filmmaking pages in our niche. And it was kind of empty, like no one was in the niche at all. It was like completely empty. Like film is big, but filmmaking for some reason was new. There wasn't a lot of filmmaking pages or anything. No one was making any money. So we paid pages and then we started with that. We made like a thousand dollars in like our first day of doing Instagram posts off of like one or two posts that we paid. So, so we made that drive you to, to buy something or? Uh, yeah. So we, we would basically make a trailer. We made these 
cool space themed trailers that I did the VFX on. We'd make this trailer and then it would send people to a link in the bio of the person who we paid for a post on. So it'd be like a filmmaking page. Maybe they have like a million followers. They would post, they change the link in bio, say, hey, go get 25% off Singularity Cinematic Sound Effects Library link in bio. And people would go and make like $1,000 the first day. And then we made $1,000 every day for a month. So we made wow. like $30,000 the first month. We made, I think, like $60,000 the second month, like $100,000 the third month. And then we were doing Facebook ads. And then it just went crazy, man. <laughs> so nobody so was crazy. selling like a, a sound, was it like a library of sound effects for filmmakers? Or you yeah. just outmarketed everybody that was selling it, basically? Um, well, no one was selling this. I think the only other company, which is a really cool company, is a company called Lens Distortions. They had one, and it, it, theirs are a little more higher end. Theirs are like $140 packs, more for professionals, but there really mm. wasn't anything for indie filmmakers, for video creators, or anything like that. And sound design is the thing that can, it's like uh, one of the main things that can take your films from being seeming sort of amateurish to a lot more professional is if you have good yeah. sound design. You know, when you go watch a trailer, it's 90% sound design, booms and whooshes. And like yeah, yeah. And it's something stuff. I noticed, man. Cause I just from like you were talking about video games, that like, cause I hear them, is it called sprites? Like, does sprites apply? Does that word apply to sound sometimes? Uh, it could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Cause sprites also of... apply to characters and stuff. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I know exactly what you're I hear like some sounds from like Counter Strike, that game that I used to play when I was 13, you know, oh, this first love person shooter that like yeah. they still use in like movies and TV shows today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that, those exact kind of sounds, those are the kind of sounds we make. So we'll use like booms and hits and risers and brams. There's all weird names for all of them that some mm. sound designers from the past came up with. You know, when you hear like the inception sounds or you hear sounds that start off a trailer or slams, you know, anything you'd hear in Transformers, that kind of stuff. But that mm. stuff was unavailable to like people who are on a budget or who are indie filmmakers. And there was no like one pack you could get that had everything in it and just good stuff you were going to use. So we're like, yeah. let's make the best pack we have. It has 400 sounds. It's just stuff we're going to use. Let's, I, I basically made a pack that I would use for myself, exactly what I needed as a filmmaker, just knowing that there's probably millions of other filmmakers like me who want the same thing. And, you know, it's, it's not really that much of a gamble if you think about it like that. It's pretty easy. It's like, I really, really need this. Would other people like me need this? Probably. And it turns out that they did, you know? Dude, I love the story, man. And uh, just so much going through my head while you're sharing it. Like, hopefully everybody that's watching too is feeling inspired. If you are, make sure you hit that like button. And if you have any feedback or questions for Lion, drop them in the comment section. And if he has time, he'll uh, maybe get back to you. Sorry, yeah, I just volunteered sure. you for doing that. If he doesn't- No, no, I'll, I'll definitely do that, man. I'll definitely do that. Nah, man, I love the story though. And like, one of the things I like to harp on too on my channel is- just creating, I call it planting seeds, you know, like multiple income streams. Cause you don't know up front, like what's really gonna connect with your customer base and what's going to really get you to that level that you want to get to. Um, exactly. what, you know, what I try to do is like a, I call it the complementary approach to making passive income. Uh, mm -hmm. I dubbed it Ryan's method, but like, you know, when I was doing them, I had no clue that I was ever going to have a YouTube channel and talk about it. You know, oh, but right. I, I realized there's a lot of like intersections in various, you know, income streams um and, and you know if you can get good at one of them you can kind of parlay that into starting another one that's very complimentary without as much effort as someone would have if they were just getting started from ground zero so exactly um, exactly which is yeah, man, so how is how is the fba business going now though so for amazon what ended up happening is after film crux blew up it got like huge and now we're like one of the biggest filmmaking companies you know i think we have like 300,000 email subscribers. So I was like, okay, perfect. Now I can redirect my attention back to chicken shit because I don't let things go. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna win no matter what. I'm not gonna stop. It's just like a challenge. It's fun to us. It's like, like I said, playing hard video games on regular Nintendo, playing Ninja Gaiden mm -hmm. or Contra. So we took it as a challenge. We're going back to chicken shit. We know it's gonna work. We just gotta get it going. So we go back. Now we have a little more money, but um, we start, uh, by doing like paying influencers on TikTok. We're like, okay, let's get it on Amazon. We went through the whole process. We got it. We had to get a brand account on Amazon. We had to get the trademark. And that process was a little bit of work. You know, it takes a long time to get the brand yeah. account. But once we got that, we're like, okay, we got a brand account. We got a trademark. We have the hate the player, which is the company store. And we have the chicken shit product up on Amazon. We sent like, I think 2000 decks to Amazon. 
Um, so like a huge crate of stuff that I shipped to my house first, took a bunch of decks out. You know, they're delivering this huge pallet. And yeah, I've I had shipped. that before, man. I've yeah, before. So you know, you definitely know. It's crazy. So annoying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we needed that because we needed some decks and I needed to make sure it was good before I sent it to Amazon since it was our first shipment. After that, we just shipped them directly from our supplier to Amazon. But yeah, shipped into Amazon. Once they were on there, we're like, now we can finally do what we're good at, which is marketing. It's like, we just got to tell people about it. Like, how hard is that going to be? And uh, at that time, you know, we, uh, we, had still, we had still been sort of doing things in the background, but not much other than maybe some small ad stuff with you. We hadn't really been doing much else. Mm. So once we got them on Amazon, we, our idea was to, okay, let's do TikTok. You know, we saw TikTok coming from a mile away. And, you know, just like Gary Vee had been saying, he's like, this thing, TikTok, man, it's underpriced attention. You got to get on TikTok. So we're like, yeah, TikTok's obvious. It has organic traffic. Instagram has no more organic. It didn't at the time, at least. Organic was doing terrible. So we weren't yeah. even paying for posts on Film Crux. We were just doing Facebook ads and Instagram ads. So we're like, we'll just pay for posts on TikTok. Let's do the exact same thing we did for Film Crux, but on the newest platform with better organic reach. So we started paying people, but TikTok, we were so early and it was so new that the influencers we were paying like hadn't done paid posts yet. So yeah. they didn't really know how to do it. They didn't really know how to make the videos well. A lot of them, we would pay them and they just never made the videos that we paid them <laughs> for, you know, <laughs> which is cool. You, uh, you expect certain amount of drop off, but they didn't have the same sort of uh, drive that Instagram influencers had. Um, gotcha. just because Instagram influencers are more seasoned, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, at for the time. sure. For sure. And this is a while ago, you know. So TikTok now, it's probably at the point where they're just as serious as on Instagram. But at the time, they were new. There's a bunch of like younger people, people who are just like teenagers and stuff, or people in college, and they, you know, they were kind of doing their best, but it wasn't really working. So we're like, well, we make viral stuff all the time. Why don't we just the game is viral, just playing it? Why don't we just shoot videos and make that? And at the time, my brother was living in uh, Miami, and he still is. And he's like, well, I'm on South Beach, right? He's like living in a penthouse in South Beach. He's like, I can look down and see people everywhere who I could play this game with on South Beach. There's plenty of cool people, plenty of beautiful people. Everything would be viral. There's famous people, a bunch of other influencers. I'll just go on the beach and play. So he took the game. He started making content. And then he started playing with people, and it started going crazy. Our TikTok account started going viral. We started getting millions and millions of views, tens of thousands of followers. But every now and then, one of the videos would get flagged. So we're getting all these sales through Amazon on Chicken Shit, and we're moving up the rankings, boom, boom, boom. And then we're getting a bunch of reviews, and all the reviews were good. We had like four and a half out of five-star reviews. Nice. And it was working, but every once in a while, a video would get flagged on TikTok, and it would say some shenanigans about TikTok's policies, but we weren't sure how we were violating any policies. You know, we weren't doing any nudity or anything, but it seems like TikTok has a bias against skin and no one's showing any more skin than people uh, just walking around South Beach. Like so, failed AI. Exactly. So it just yeah. started flagging stuff randomly and enough stuff got flagged that our entire account went down. Like we had videos that were going crazy viral, millions and millions of views. Yeah, yeah. We were getting... Probably we were at the point where we were about to get 10,000 followers a week easy. And that was going to go up to maybe 100,000 followers a month that month. And probably pa way past that. We were, we were on the roll to be getting millions of followers. And the account went down. All our videos stopped getting shown on the For You page. All our organic reach stopped. The account was up technically if you go search for it. But it just stopped. So we like made shadow like banned. Three. Yeah, exactly. We got shadow banned. So we made like three other accounts. We tried to do it again. We tried to be more strict. Make sure we're definitely not violating anything. Same thing happened to each one of the accounts. So then we were like, well, that's that plan. And then to top it all off, COVID starts. So it gets even worse because we have a social game. And you kind of don't want to play a social game when everyone's supposed to be social distancing. So then right. we started to be like, should we even be marketing this right now? You know? Uh, so we were like, you know what? Maybe it's good that the TikTok went down. Maybe we should just hang off. Film Crux is doing great. Let's just kind of take it easy, mark it in the background, build up some social proof and stuff, and we'll just wait to start pushing the game. That way everyone can stay inside. Everyone can, you know, kind of hang out, take it easy. 
And then, but I kind of, I was worried because I was like, this is probably going to drag on for years. So, but I was like, we'll take it easy. And then once we start getting in the tail end, we'll start marketing again. And so now we're just now on the tail end of marketing again. It, this whole time, it's just been running in the background, running organic, getting sales, getting reviews and stuff. We still get like daily sales, but it's just, we haven't been able to market it. We've only been able to yeah. work on Film Crux. And now we can just now start marketing again. So, and now we know what to do. So hopefully it's going to go crazy, but it was so much work. Like it's weird that I started chicken shit like a year before I even started film crux and film crux has been successful for years now and chicken yeah. shit I'm still working on, but it and still gets sales daily even. And that's the other part that I forgot to tell you is the, our whole plan for chicken shit is we were supposed to do Amazon PPC. We're like, it's easy. You just get on Amazon. We'll run Amazon PPC ads. Right. No problem. We'll get to the top of the search. You would have crushed it too. Cause that was probably like when that was like when Amazon was forcing you kind of everybody to shift into that, you know, they, they made some yeah. changes to how they wanted you to rank on Amazon to really exactly. pigeonhole you into paying for, you know, placement, which we were fine with. Cause we finally had money. So I was like, we'll just kill it on Amazon PP PPC. We'll just dump money. We know people are going to buy it and we'll make the money back. And they did. As soon as we started Am Amazon PPC, it went crazy. We we're instantly flying up the rankings. We we're going to be no number one in no time because I think we had the best game, which sounds biased. But of all the games on there, it's definitely the one I would want to play the most if I wasn't me and I didn't make it. But mm -hmm. even if it wasn't, it at least had to be top three best games. So I was like, OK, we definitely got to be one of the best games. I'm sure people want it. It's cool. It looks different. The design is cool. I'm sure people will want to try it after they just see the reviews, after they just try it or see any video of someone trying it, they'll get the concept. And it fits a niche that no one's making games for, which is games that you go play out in public. We we're like the first one to do that. And yeah, it killed it. Amazon PPC was going crazy. But then Amazon shut down our PPC account because you can't advertise drinking games. It was a combination of that and the name chicken shit. So at first we were yeah. like, was it a mistake to use the name chicken shit? Like, is that going to stop us from running ads? But it turns out that I guess for whatever reason, you could post, you could have listed a drinking game, but you couldn't run Amazon PPC ads on it. But there was nowhere anywhere that said that before we started. That was our whole plan from the beginning. We'll just mm -hmm. run Amazon PPC and we'll be good. So our entire plan, the entire concept of what we were supposed to do to get chicken shit going was halted right there. So we were stuck from the beginning and we had no choice but to pivot. We, they were working so well, they just stopped us from being able to advertise drinking games. And we had a shift to doing other stuff. That's when we started with the TikTok influencers. That's when we started our own TikTok. And then the TikTok influencers weren't working. Our own TikTok was working amazing. And then that got shut down. And then COVID came. And then so now we're here where all those other plans, they had like just impossible forks in the road. And now we're good. We know exactly what to do. It's going to be like an easy coast where we're going to make organic, uh, organic, organic content, just not on the beach. We'll just make it on the street. No skin showing, no excuse for TikTok. I bet so. you the <laughs> South Beach uh, people, though, definitely helped with like the clickbaitiness on. <laughs> yeah, for sure. On, on TikTok. Yeah, for sure. It definitely helps. But it's cool because you could still have people on South Beach. It just won't be quite as crazy as on the beach. But you actually yeah. have more content just walking around the street because the game is really designed to play anywhere where there's people. And really on the beach, you know, we'd go out one time and we'd get like maybe four or five videos that would be viral. And then you get a couple other videos that were just cool and we'd post all those. Yeah. But I think on the street, you'll have a higher level of ones that would be viral just because you can do 10 times more challenges. You don't have to walk as far to get from person to person for challenges. Crowds sort of form. And it's really fun on the street because it feels more like a group thing, you know, so... I think that'll work. And what's cool now is we can still do the beach stuff on our Instagram. You know, we have an Instagram that has like 137,000 oh, yeah. followers. Um, so nothing crazy, but it's 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 hard because uh, Instagram's organic traffic is still kind of bad, even with Reels. But we could still do all the beach content on Reels. And I think that'll work great, you know? Yeah, man. I, I love that you're sharing all the like what worked, what didn't work, what threw a wrench in your, your plan that was working, et cetera. Because it's got to be super useful for everybody that's watching. Like I, I, I'm not like big into social media. So just hearing this, I love hearing it. And, you know, part of my strategy is just like, I kind of stick to what works for me. Yeah. Uh, so if I can find a way to like dip my toes into TikTok and whatever, like Instagram reels, like maybe, you know, I actually was watching yeah. videos on reels this morning, but 
still in the back of my head, I'm like, oh, you know, there's only so much time in a day. Do I do I go for it or do I just kind of lean on what's been working with YouTube? But um, yeah, yeah, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to like share all this uh, these insights, man. Yeah, well, I think you have the right strategy because um, I use the sort of David and Goliath approach. Um, Malcolm Gladwell has this book um, called David and Goliath, and he talks about how we think David is like the underdog, right? Because David goes out, he's this little guy, he's fighting this giant who's killed probably hundreds of guys in battle. Everyone's terrified of him. It's going to be a one a one on one fight that stops you know all these people in the army from dying. And you're like, this guy David is small. He's like a shepherder. You know, he has like one of those sort of Old Testament-y kind of careers, you know, it's like you're herding mm -hmm. goats and stuff. How's this guy going to fight like a trained killer who's a giant? And then what you find out is that David used like a slingshot. Yeah, it was like a sling where he'd sling like a rock. And it had basically the power of a nine millimeter bullet shot from like pretty close range. And so if you think about that, if a guy comes out with a nine millimeter and another guy has a sword, it doesn't seem fair at all, right? It seems like David clearly has the advantage. Mm -hmm. And so David is basically playing to his strengths. If he tried to fight like Goliath, he would get destroyed. So he tries to fight like David. And if you think about the best people in almost every niche, you think about Steph Curry. Steph Curry's not going to try to play basketball like Shaq. He's going to try to play in a way that's best for him. He's small. He's fast. He's a great shooter. So he leans 1 million percent into that. And now he completely changed basketball to where there's a thousand kids who are just trying to be good at three-pointers. But if you look back 50 years ago, no one was taking three pointers hardly at all, you know, in the NBA. Mm -hmm. And it's much better to play to what you're good at or what works best for you and then become, you know, have a monopoly on that than trying to be like the 18th best pizza place in Chicago. You know what I'm saying? Dude, for sure. It's a great analogy. Have a man. Plus, <laughs> plus, Steph had the had a bunch of statisticians that were like woke up to the fact that it's like, oh yeah, shooting like the three pointer is actually not a bad uh <laughs> statistically yeah. speaking right you got like some yeah. good um, logic behind doing it behind yeah. jacking up a bunch of threes <laughs> and he's all like the championship the teams game. literally changed their strategy to that yeah. they're like all right we're a three-point first team and you start getting all these teams who were like primarily using three-pointers and just because Steph showed them hey you can play like this they built the whole team around him now all of the shooters on the warriors are like three-point shooters and you want to be like that and and Shaq wouldn't want to play like Steph, right? If you're the biggest guy to ever live, you want to play like Goliath, right? That's your yep. best bet. Boom, get in the paint, dunk on people. So we just do that same thing with business. We take the David and Goliath approach. We say, what's our David thing? What's our slingshot that we can use that we have an advantage on? Because we can't play like these Goliaths because we don't have the money or we don't have the resources. Or we don't have the time or the manpower. So what do we have? You know, And then just lean into that. So I think you're doing it right with like, focusing on the stuff you're already doing well at and then just getting really, really good at that. I mean, you're going to kill it if you keep that up. I appreciate it, Lion. All right. And then as we wrap up, man, what's next for Film Crux? I guess that is like the the major breadwinner right now. So if you want to share anything about like what's coming up this year, you got big plans for anything or, or maybe like five-year roadmap, anything like that that you want to share? Yeah. So um, Film Crux right now, we're, we're working on a bunch of projects that are in early mm. pre-production. So I can't really talk about them with other people. But uh, right now we have a bunch of products up. We just released our Film Crux Mega Bundle, which has all eight of our products we have so far. And we just bundled them together for one lower price. So if you're starting with filmmaking and you just want to have everything you need to start, you can just get this and you're good to go. You can start. You got sound design. You got Foley. You got everything like that. Um, and that's really good because we're just trying to make stuff that makes it easier for beginning filmmakers. Trying to make the stuff we needed when we were starting off. And uh, that's how I kind of design everything. Like, what do I want? And then hopefully other people will want it. So then moving forward with Film Crux, we're going to do a podcast in the future. And then we're going to be an actual film production company. So we're going to start making actual feature length movies and TV shows, hopefully pitch some stuff to Netflix. And we have some potential documentaries going right now. So the goal is to make Film Crux sort of the, the Pixar of live action film, where if you think about most movie studios, you don't really care about the studio. Like no one cares about Warner Brothers Studios, um, with the exception maybe a little bit of A24. No one really cares about the studio in live action. But Pixar, when you see a Pixar movie, everyone knows like this is cool, right? I trust Pixar. They make really great movies. Finding Nemo. You have all these great memories of them, Ratatouille. And you actually care about the studio. That is actually a thing that convinces you to go see their next movie even if you know nothing about it. 
And so we want to take that same approach Pixar did with animation and apply it to live action films, which seems obvious, but it seems like no one's done it yet. So that's really the direction we're going with Film Crux to start becoming a film production company and really try to take over by being a studio where every single thing we make is good or we try to make it good. And then you have a reputation for that. And then you get diehard fans in a similar way to how Apple has diehard fans or, or how Pixar has diehard fans. You right. just make good stuff that makes people more loyal to the brand because they care, you know, because they trust that you're actually trying, you know, and you're not just putting out thing after thing and playing the volume game like a lot of other movie studios do. Dude, I love it, man. I love the the ambition and the dedication and like how you always kind of you, you start with like, oh, you know, I I've made a product that I would use. Right. It's coming yeah. back to those like core competencies of like, you know, don't pedal bull, don't don't pedal BS on your <laughs> potential customers. Right. Like, <laughs> right. Right. If you're, right. You know, Make that right. killer, the killer app, that killer product, uh, something that you know you take a lot of pride in, that you see the utility in, that you would use, and um, go market it like a beast the best way you know how. And exactly. next thing you know, you're sitting on a uh, mega successful business in a couple of years, dude. I, I love the story, man. Thanks, man. I mean, you're exactly right. It's it's so much easier if you have something you really love because if you really love the product, then no one has to tell you to go tell other people about it. You feel like bad for them that they don't know about it. You're like, oh, I got exactly what you need, man. You like, you go out all the time. You're not having any fun. Just play this game chicken shit. I tell people all the time, I give them free copies just because mm -hmm. I don't want them to go out drinking and be bored sitting around on their phones, to, you know, with their friends they came with not having any fun. So I just give people free copies. I'm like, go play. Trust me. Thank me later. You know, and once you have something like that, it's easy to want to market it. It's usually hard for people to market stuff that they don't believe in or that they don't really like, that they don't really care about. But if you really care about it, you really like it, then, you know, no one can tell you to stop marketing it. You know, it's way easier. Dude, love it, man. All right, cool. Well, hey, uh, I'll put some links in the description of where they can find you. I'll put a link to uh, Chicken Shit on Amazon. I'll put a link to Film Crux. Anything else you want me to plug or you want to plug? No, that's it. I mean, if you want to put the Instagrams there, that's cool. And if people have okay. questions, yeah, I'll try to answer all of them on uh, under the YouTube video once you post it. And uh, if people have anything else, you know, they can just email me. You can go to F Film Crux and go to the contact page. But yeah, if anyone leaves comments, I'll try my best to answer as many of them as I can because I, I wish I knew more stuff so I could help my past self. So if you're working on e-commerce and you need like some help or tips or you want to know how I did something, just let me know. I'll definitely help. Dude, I love that, man. Like I say to people, it's like, you know, I am future you if you put in the work. Like, I'm just proof that, you know, yeah. you can get there. You just got to kind of grind through the tough stuff. So, yeah. Exactly. Love it, man. All right, man. Thank you, Lion, for being here. Thanks again, man. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Ryan. I appreciate it. Take it easy.